All right, this is Mary Williford. I am here in Carver, North Carolina with Dan Whittle. It is July 21st, 2016. Again, my name is Mary Williford, M-A-R-Y-W-I-L-L-I-F-O-R-D. And Dan, could you say and spell your name? Yes, I am Dan, Daniel Whittle, uh, D-A-N-I-E-L, W-H-I-T-T-L-E. All right, well, thank you for agreeing to this interview, Dan. So I want to start out with just a little bit of background information about yourself, if you can uh, tell us where you grew up and when you were born. I was born on October 10th, 1962 in Glasgow, Kentucky. I grew up in Kentucky in a small farming town in western Kentucky named Litchfield. My uh, parents divorced when I was in third grade. I'm one of six kids, by the way. And uh, we moved to New England, to New Hampshire. So I spent the school year in New Hampshire, Manchester and the summer is on our farm in Kentucky. Sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Where did you go to school? Went to school um, you know, in, in, Man uh, in Manchester uh, Public Schools and then in college I decided to go back south. So I went to Nashville, Tennessee to Vanderbilt uh, University and um, took a couple years off to wait tables and to be a, a, a a fishing guide in Alaska, and then went to law school in uh, Colorado, University of Colorado, Boulder. And what made you want to come back down south for college? Just, I, you know, I always identified with the south. Uh, I always liked the south. Um, applied to schools in Boston and, and uh, in Tennessee, basically, and just wanted to come back. So, I mean, it really did feel kind of like coming home a bit until I got to the South, in which case I kind of felt like New England was home, so always, t always torn. So did you, um, you mentioned that you had been a fishing guide in Alaska. Did you do a lot of fishing and outdoor stuff when you were younger? Um, yeah, a fair amount. And um, actually in New Hampshire, we lived about a half hour from the coast, uh, 30 miles, so a little longer than a half hour back then. And we, you know, we used to go to the beach a lot with my grandparents who were New Englanders, and um, I got really into seafood, into lobster, uh, stuff that was very foreign to us in, in Kentucky, and to deep sea fishing. So for a while I wanted to be a lobster fisherman when I was a little kid. Uh, I romanticized what is a truly difficult and challenging uh, profession I found out later. But, um, and, and then I um, uh, did a lot of outdoor stuff in college in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. And, uh, and got polit politicized in college. Wanted to combine my love of the outdoors with doing something to protect the environment and uh, ended up uh, working in Alaska. So uh, what do you do for a living? What did you do for a living? Mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer uh, <clears throat> and um, I work for the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a um, you know, large US-based uh, NGO, nonprofit conservation organi organization based in New York with an office in North Carolina where I work in Raleigh. And it's been around, the office in Raleigh has been around for about 28 years. The organization's been around since 1967, so almost 50 years. Um, and I've been with EDF as it's known for coming on 19 years. Before that, I worked. Uh, for the Governor Governor Jim Hunt's administration uh, in the Department of Environment, Health, and Natural Resources, where I was first a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Natural Resources and then a senior policy advisor for the Secretary on all kinds of issues, including commercial fishing, hog farms, uh, forest conservation, and the like. And then before that, I was in a private practice in, in Washington, D.C. So how did you get involved with uh, fisheries management in your line of work? That's a good, that's a good question. I um, had always done environmental and natural resources law. I went to law school in, in Colorado for that purpose. Uh, took a lot of courses in public lands law, uh, water, uh, natural resources. I spent uh, a, a part of a semester in Yellowstone uh, in law school as part of a uh, natural resources seminar looking at how um, the federal government in that case works with stakeholders, with uh, ranchers, farmers, Indian tribes, townspeople, uh, park users, recreationalists, 
how they come together to decide how to use public resources. And in the case of Yellowstone, it was very interesting because you had five national forests and you had two national parks and you had a lot of people who had a lot of opinions on how those public lands should be used. Um, so that really sort of got me going. And, and, and when I practiced law in D.C., I represented Indian tribes in um, Montana, the Blackfeet Indian Nation, the Navajo, and various others. And um, many of the issues, and including uh, Alaska Native corporations in, 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 uh, in the North Slope of Alaska, and all of these tribes, we worked on everything from Indian health care to you know, whatever issue came before them, uh, federal issue in, in D.C., but a lot of land issues, how to manage reservations in terms of energy resources, in terms of fish, uh, in terms of wildlife, et cetera. So it just was a culmination of interest in, in how to sustainably use resources. And then I, my first day on the job uh, for Governor Hunt, I got a call from his chief of staff, Ed Turlington, saying that a, uh, a fishing boat from North Carolina was in trouble uh, off the coast of Alaska, uh, basically had been accused of uh, overfishing scallops, and, uh, and might I look into it and see if I could uh, uh, find a resolution to the problem. So that was the you know, first day on the job for Governor Hunt. Uh, I was introduced to the uh, controversy surrounding commercial fishing, and uh, I've never looked back. Can you tell us a little bit more about that specific first day on the job instance? Sure. So I was in my uh, you know small office in the Archdale building in Raleigh, which uh, is this just somewhat dreadful state office building, and I uh, was literally putting my stuff away. I got a call from the governor's office from again Ed Turlington. I did not know who he was at the time. And he said, "I understand you're new. Uh, understand you have a back. You're you're a lawyer and." Uh, I'd like you to help out. We've we've got this boat called the, uh, Mr. Big from Juan Cheese, North Carolina. It's a scallop boat and it's been fishing uh, in Alaska. And I'm not sure what the what the issue is, but the owner of the boat is telling us that uh, he's being harassed by uh, Alaskan uh, not Coast Guard but Alaskan officials. And and he says he's fishing legally outside of state waters and federal waters. So can you look into it? And uh, <clears throat> I was actually pretty excited. This is like a, a real problem to solve. But I wasn't really sure where to start. So uh, I did have the number for the uh, fisherman, or the, the guy who owned the boat. I called him. And, uh, and he, he basically said uh, his boat is doing everything right. Uh, they're catching a lot of scallops in federal waters, and, and the state authorities just won't leave them alone. Uh, so I started getting uh, collecting facts and got his side of the story and then I and then I was kind of wasn't sure what to do next this is really in the age before internet so I couldn't simply get on the web and and read the Alaska uh, you know the Anchorage newspaper or anything so you know I thought well you know I know someone in Alaska a, a law school friend of mine worked for the Attorney General uh, in Alaska so I tracked down his number and I called him I hadn't talked to him since law school, so about you know over four years. And I said, uh, John, uh, this is Dan. I'm calling you from North Carolina. Uh, I'm working for Governor Hunt on, on uh, fisheries issues. And the first thing he said to me was, uh, Mr. Big. And the second thing he said to me is a pirate. And, uh, and so we had a conversation, and basically... He said, from the Alaskan perspective, you've got this big boat uh, that's capable of catching more scallops than the annual quota in Alaska. So they, the state had a quota. Uh, it had been reached. The fishing boat from North Carolina that had a, a license to fish in, in state waters of Alaska decided just to move outside of state waters and then just continue fishing. Uh, legally and was in fact fishing legally and the state said this is you know may follow the letter of the law but absolutely violates the spirit of the law they're concerned about their scallop stocks and uh, and, and they simply won't stop fishing now the boat was so big they could catch scallops all day long all week long uh, for a long time and then take their catch 
down to Seattle. So ne they never had to go back into Alaska waters. Uh, but uh, you know, the Alaskans were, were ticked off because you know they were they were concerned about the resource. Their boats certainly were not doing the same. So economically, environmentally, it was it was a disaster in their eyes. Apparently, all over the newspaper, uh, this is on the front page in, in Anchorage. So uh, I was in a bit of a quandary as uh, first day on the job, and uh, but essentially decided that uh, you know this is probably something we did not want to get in in the middle of. It seemed like the state of Alaska had a good case. I also talked to NOAA, uh, that manages federal waters and they uh, explained to me that there was a petition to actually close federal waters make an emergency closure because of this fishing boat so um, so i called the governor's office and I, and I said i think it's in our interest just to sit this one out it's not clear uh, you know who's in the right here it does appear that the fishing boat is legally fishing for the moment but uh the passions are pretty strong up there so it might be best just to uh, sit this one out, which is what uh, I recall the governor did, and uh, and the federal government did close the waters. The boat did return to port. I don't think there was any legal action taken. I can't recall. But again, that was my first introduction that uh, that tempers can get pretty strong in commercial fishing, and there's not usually a black and white um, answer to things. <laughs> Mr. Big. Mr. Big. <laughs> Messing up Alaska. Um, so, I'm sorry, what year did you start working in the uh, for Governor Hunt? So I started working in 1995, actually, in mm -hmm. February of 1995. And I worked there until about November of 97. And what was sort of your... Um, understanding or your initial take on fisheries and fisheries management in North Carolina when you started there? Well, I started completely uh, as a blank slate. Um, I had done a little work um, temporarily for actually a public interest law firm in North Carolina called the Southern Environmental Law Center. and But my work there had been on uh, wetlands issues in the eastern part of the state, and there it involved uh, timber companies that were logging in wetlands and whether that was the right thing to do or not. I had zero experience on commercial fishing issues, so uh, not long after uh, my Mr. Big encounter, uh, I came to understand that I would be working on that issue for North Carolina because uh, uh, there had recently been a moratorium on new commercial fishing licenses. So unbeknownst to me when I started, commercial fishing was a major issue. There was concern um, that there were too many commercial fishermen on the water, that stocks, fish stocks were declining, and that's flounder, that's gray trout, also known as weak fish, that's snappers, groupers, other species that are commercially very important in North Carolina. Uh, there had been a lot of controversy between recreational fishermen and commercial fishermen um, over how to allocate the resource. Uh, but ultimately, there, there was concern from many quarters that a, a break was needed, uh, that there was a need to cap the number of commercial fishermen and to take time out to understand how to better manage. You know, whether that meant uh, allocating more quota to recreational fishing sector or reducing the number of boats or something. But um, it was basically a timeout so uh, all the various stakeholders could come together with scientists and managers and officials uh, and, and talk it through. So that's, that's uh, I knew nothing and then I uh, quickly had to study up on, on who was who and what was what and what the issues were. Yeah, so the, uh, the Moratorium Steering Committee was formed in 1994, so mm -hmm. just before you right. started. Um, but do you, what's your take on what exactly was going on in North Carolina with fisheries that mm -hmm. may have compelled them to take action in 1994? What was it about that year where they were like, we finally need a break? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I need to rack my brain. Um, I can't, re I'm trying to remember if it was a controversy over summer flounder. I know that summer, uh, Summer and southern flounder are two related but different species. 
very important in North Carolina. And there had been action in the late 80s and early 90s to reduce the number of licenses or permits for that. So there was a buyback program. What prompted um, the commercial, uh, the moratorium, uh, I think had something to do with blue crabs. Um, I can't recall. There's a lot of controversy over blue crabs as well. There was also a fair amount of controversy over the use of nets, of gill nets in coastal waters. And by coastal waters, talking about you know the sounds like core sound, Pamlico sound, other near shore waters under state jurisdiction where commercial fishing takes place. Um, in Florida, there had been uh, a real battle between recreational fishing uh, sector, the rec uh, recreational fishermen and commercial fishing. And in that case, they, they, uh, the legislature in Florida sided with the recreational fishermen and, and enacted a net ban, basically saying that commercial fishermen could not use gill nets and other kinds of nets in state waters. So there's a lot of fear in North Carolina that something similar would happen. And, uh, and so the governor and the legislature was getting pressure from both sides to resolve what was becoming a real intense uh, you know, battle. Really, at, at that point, as far as I could see, uh, a battle of allocation. Conservation was certainly present, certainly something motivating the Division of Marine Fisheries, but it seemed like the biggest uh, dispute was around uh, allocation and the impact of commercial fishing on, on uh, fish available to recreational fishermen through these you know, nets. And so you mentioned um, some of the different, <coughs> excuse me, some of the different um, interests, like people with interested in conservation versus allocation. Um, do you feel like there was a sort of general, not necessarily unity, but that, uh, an agreement that, you know, this is something that we need or this is something that should be passed? or did you find it to be a bit more contentious than that? That's, that's a great question. <clears throat> there was not a lot of unity. There was not a lot of um, consensus, as I recall. There was a general consensus that, um, that um, the, there was sort of a consensus that, that public waters, that coastal waters were supposed to be held for the public, something called the public trust doctrine you, you might hear. But people interpreted the public trust doctrine differently, and there's an entire legal doctrine uh, interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court on what that actually is. But, but there seemed to be a general consensus that North Carolina is an important state for fishing, for fisheries, um, you know, and that it's critically important to sustain fish populations. But as I recall, that was about where the agreement broke down. Uh, there was a real d debate over who is entitled you know, to those fish, whether somehow commercial fishing uh, got in the way of the public's right to fish. There's a lot of discussion about, from recreational side, that they contribute a lot more to the economy. They spend a lot more money when they go fishing. They catch a lot fewer fish, which is actually not always true. Um, but then, you know, there, there, there were people that said commercial fishing is important to non-fishermen because, you know, we're consumers of seafood and we value having local fresh seafood over, say, imported seafood. So there are all these debates going on. Uh, but as far as, I, you know, as far as I remember, very little consensus. Uh, environmental groups, and I would say state agencies, were kind of caught in the middle. They tended to agree with both sides on some some issues um, and so they they played a, a role of trying to bring people together not always terribly successfully um, and then the state you know governor hunt you know said to to me and others in the meeting once that um, i can't remember the numbers but something like you know commercial fishing accounts for you know a very small percentage of the state's economy but the time I spend on commercial fishing is a huge percentage of my time as governor. You know, fishermen will walk in my office, you know, without scheduling an appointment in their white boots and their fish buckets and demand an audience, and I have to give it to them. And that was my experience, too. Um, you know, fishermen, especially commercial fishermen, were not shy about uh, showing up and, and telling you what they thought. And so it was, 
for, for me, it was actually a very contentious atmosphere. Uh, the state was caught in the middle. They were criticized by both sides as being too biased, you know, for the other side. And so it was a pretty difficult and challenging time. You know, right around the time the moratorium steering committee started, uh, the governor fired the state fisheries director, Bill Hogarth, and, and hired a new guy from New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, it, it was just a lot of contention. <clears throat> yeah, so um, what exactly was your role in this whole process? Like, what, <laughs> what was your sort of day-to-day? My, uh, you know, that, it, it, my role evolved over time. Um, I was principally in charge of advising the Assistant Secretary of Natural Resources. Her name was Joan Weld at the time. And, uh, <clears throat> and she oversaw the Division of Marine Fisheries. So she was the political person in charge of commercial fisheries and recreational fishing. So I was supposed to advise her on uh, you know, policy issues, political issues, um, you know, legal issues. I would, her eyes and ears, I would go to meetings with her, I would take notes, I would advise her on what I heard, I would spend a lot of time with constituents, I'd go to meetings, I'd go to, to moratorium steering committee hearings. But essentially I was uh, both her eyes and ears, but I was also the the, the department's you know, face of any of these meetings, their representative. So I would, um, you know, act on behalf of the secretary, the assistant secretary and the secretary, and essentially the governor. Uh, principally, our role was intended to be to take in information, to listen, um, which we did a lot of. We spent a lot of time on fishing boats, spent a lot of time eating lunch uh, on the coast, which was a real perk of the job. But just, you know, listening to what people had to say and how they thought the problem should be resolved. So, uh, so from my perspective, it was a really fun job because I got to uh, combine my sort of legal skills, uh, write memos on advising, you know, what position we should take on, you know, uh, some aspect of legislation that was being drafted. We would show up at the legislature, we would present testimony, we would, um, meet with legislative staff. They were very involved for various members, including the Senate uh, leader, Mark Basnight, who's from Antio, who's very involved in this debate. Uh, we would get a lot of pressure from them on what position the governor should take. We uh, would meet with the governor quite fre frequently to advise him on where he should stand. We, should, we would also report back to him on, on what we were hearing in these meetings. And uh, there's a moratorium steering committee headed by the chair of the Marine Fisheries Commission, Bob Lucas. And and he was also caught in the middle. His job as the steering committee chief was to uh, assemble public comment and then to advise the governor and essentially the legislature on, on what all this meant and how policy should be reformed ultimately to to move forward. Again, this was a moratorium, so it was intended to be temporary. And it was intended to give the legislature and the governor time to come up with new solutions to, to more sustainably manage uh, fisheries and, and, and also how to allocate the resource more equitably among the users. So. Do you have any insight into why North Carolina chose to have a moratorium period rather than, I think you had said Florida had had an issue like this prior. Did they have a moratorium? Like, yeah, why um, didn't they yeah. just sort of like keep stuff open while they worked through it? Why the moratorium? You know, that's a good question. I, I, I think the, from what I recall and what my understanding, having been around policy for a long time, a moratorium or a timeout basically allows policymakers to say, we don't know what the answer is. In other words, you don't have to choose sides. Uh, in, in the case of Florida, they may have had a moratorium, I can't remember, but ultimately they chose to side with the recreational sector and said, we're going to ban commercial fishing nets. Uh, in, in the case of Carolina, and, in, and Governor Hunt was great at this, you know, uh, he said, well, let's just get everyone around the table and let's just, you know, let's just calm down, let's just think it through, let's come up with a solution that will work for everyone. 
And that's what a moratorium does. It's a timeout. Now, it, it did impose a, a cap on commercial licenses, but the cap was actually um, high enough. So, so the pain uh, of the moratorium was considered modest or minimal. Now, if you wanted to get into commercial fishing during the moratorium, you had to find someone who was willing to, to sell you a license. And so we would have a lot of people come to us and ask us if they could, if we could help them figure out how to get a license. There are all kinds of exceptions to the rules. And so I got people from Western North Carolina claiming to be a commercial fisherman. And, and what they were is they were, you know, retired part-time fishermen who wanted to use commercial gear. And so they wanted to appeal to the Division of Marine Fisheries to get a commercial fishing license. And then you had the full-timers saying, you know, the reason things are so messed up is we've got all these part-timers who don't, aren't real commercial fishermen, and we, you know, we should start by eliminating licenses to them, because, you know, they're only make-believe fishermen. Uh, so you had those issues going on. But the moratorium essentially says, you know, time out, let's, let's get together. And so politically, it's arguably a safer position to take. It buys you time before you have to make tough decisions. And so it's, it's used for other policy issues as well, you know, like a study committee or, or the like. So. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, you said you sat in on a lot of these um, hearing, listening sessions, essentially, mm -hmm. for the steering committee. Um, can you describe how some of those went? They were often, uh, the uh, steering committee meetings were often at night, <clears throat> so people could come to them after work. They were often in, I mean, eastern North Carolina primarily, not just on the coast, places like Greenville, um, Rocky Mount, probably but also throughout the coast. Uh, and they were an opportunity for people to come and talk. Uh, as I recall, the majority of comments were from either fishermen or family members, spouses, children, parents, uh, retired fishermen. Uh, you did get the recreational fishing sector represented, so people who were just you know, recreational fishermen who like to go on the weekends uh, or fishing guides that align themselves more with the recreational side. Uh, but they tended to be very emotional. I mean, people would show up and, uh, you know, they'd be given, you know, three minutes to, you know, comment. And it was rare that someone stuck within the guidelines. In some cases, people would go on and on and, uh, and the chair would have to to intervene, but people got quite emotional, and it really came down to issues of uh, heritage, issues of livelihood, especially. Uh, you know, a lot of accus accusations that either the government or uh, the recreational fishing sector wanted to put me out of business. Um, very heartfelt. The government, uh, the state government, was not uh, held in, in great esteem. Uh, they were considered part of the problem. They were considered uh, <clears throat> they were considered part of the problem because uh, fishermen often perceived that that the government just made things more difficult. They created all these rules and regulations, size limits, seasons, etc. And if they would just leave fishermen alone, they would figure out how to manage the resource sustainably. They maintained that they had an interest in making sure fish populations were healthy. After all, that was their living. So uh, there was a real perception, and this came through in the steering committee uh, public hearings, that the government's just meddling. They're just getting in the way. Um, you know, from the recreational side, they tended to say, you know, we're seeing fewer fish. I've been fishing all my life, and, uh, you know, it just breaks my heart to see, you know, a net washed up on shore with a lot of dead fish. Um, and so a lot of finger pointing. Um, people would sit on opposite sides of the room. Um, and so for me, it was a real education because I had sympathies actually prim primarily with, with the commercial fishermen. Um, and, and by that, I mean I really was, was sympathetic to uh, their stories of earning a living. Uh, you know, it's easy to romanticize that, but you know, what they were doing was you know, extremely hard work. Uh, not well paid, uh, but they were drawn to it either because 
that's what they just love doing more than anything else or because their parent, you know, their dad, grandfather, parents had done it, so it was in their blood. So I had great sympathy for their point of view, but as a environmentalist, a conservationist, you know, I had real concerns as well that that something needed to be done to better manage. You know, there's a concept called the tragedy of the commons, and that, uh, you know, if you don't manage a public resource, uh, you get this tendency that everyone is in it for themselves. There's a race to fish, for example. So I really felt like there should be some practical, uh, you know, better management. How do you incentivize fishermen to do a better job? And there was a talk back then about, you know, individual quotas. You know, you know, take the quota for summer flounder, for example, and allocate it among fishermen. So they had a right to a certain percentage which is something I work on today with, with my group, and it's been successful in the Gulf of Mexico um, and, and you know other parts of the country, other countries. Um, but at the time, it was very controversial because uh, commercial fishermen actually felt like that was a threat, that it doesn't make sense to divvy up a public resource among people that seemed too much like a private property right. And so that was... So I found myself very sympathetic to commercial fishermen, but... Um, they did not necessarily see that I or others in the government um, had their best interest in mind. So it, it was it was frustrating. Yeah. Do you um, have any particular individuals or maybe places you went, folks you ate lunch with, um, whose stories really stood out to you or that you really remember? Yeah, that's... Um, <clears throat> There are a lot of players I'm done. Um, you know, it's a long time ago, so names are escaping me. But um, Arden Moore from Shalote in the southern part of the state uh, was a small commercial fisherman. He was a gill netter. Uh, and gill nets are these long nets that you sort of set in the water. You let them soak, and then, you know, fish basically swim into them and, and get caught by their gills. And then you go back, you pull up the net, and uh, and harvest the fish that are of legal size. Uh, and so he was a small gill net netter. I think he ran a couple hundred yards of gill net. Um, you know, a very modest living out of it, very small boat. Uh, he invited me to go fishing, and uh, he was in the southern part. So the fisheries in North Carolina are divided regionally. There's a lot of shrimp. Uh, sh shrimp fishing in the south, so a lot of nets, a lot of trawl boats, and then gill nets and various things. Uh, but it's sort of smaller scale in the north around Wan Chi's, Harker's Island north. Um, you tend to get bigger boats with different kinds of fishing gear and different kinds of higher volumes, etc. Um, so I was really drawn to Arden. You know, I had lunch with him and his wife, and he called me a ridge runner. Uh, you know, meaning I wasn't from the coast. Uh, I found out later that the tires on my truck actually said Ridge Runner. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he knew that. It was kind of a coincidence. But you know, he there's. Uh, I found that working with people like Arden Moore or Murray Fulcher, who who ran a fish house in Ocracoke, who ran a bunch of boats uh, with pound nets, which is another kind of you know uh, traditional fishing gear in North Carolina. Uh, I found that in interacting with these fishermen, you know, all of this sort of friction would disappear. I, mean, I was from the government, but I was a normal guy. I was really keenly interested in getting on the water. I loved getting in their fishing boats. I love seafood, uh, something I learned to love up in New England. And so, you know, th there was no distance when you were with these guys. Uh, you know, their stories were heartfelt. Uh, they were committed to making things better. They were worried that they were, they're, the, you know, their, their way of life was fading out. Uh, but I was just really taken by, you know, their personal stories. And, uh, and that influenced me when I would advise the secretary or the governor. I would say, you know, these guys are for real. They're not, they're not making this st stuff up. They're genuinely concerned. But what I found is that, is that the interest that they communicated in these, you know, visits to their boats or uh, to their houses were not necessarily what you heard in the steering committees. First of all, the tone was different, and, um, and often in the steering committees it was as if people were reading from a script, 
provided to them by the um, North Carolina Fisheries Association, which we haven't talked about, but uh, the seafood industry is represented and has been represented for years by this group called the NCFA. Uh, and they purport to, uh, and I use that word intentionally, they purport and have purported to represent commercial fishermen. Uh, and in some respects, they do and, and have. Um, but the demographic of commercial fishing is very varied in North Carolina, which I came to find out by spending a lot of time on the coast. You had small guys like Arden Moore. You had uh, you know, small seafood dealers like Murray Fulcher. You had uh, crabbers like Willie Phillips up on the Scuppernong in Columbia. Uh, you, you had you know, offshore boats in Hatteras. So it was a real diverse fishery, and there are a bunch of other people. Uh, Jody Gay was a guy down in the uh, south, uh, southern part of the state. Uh, but they all spoke with one voice through the North Carolina Fisheries Association, which was unfortunate because I always had the impression that the NCFA was speaking for the seafood industry, the bigger boats, the seafood companies, mostly in Wan Chi's and elsewhere and that they had a real interest in everyone speaking from the same uh, hymn book, or same whatever the expression is, uh, singing from the same hymn book. And uh, you see that in, in, in uh, you know, the pork industry here. You'll see you know, companies like Smithfield Foods and others speaking on behalf of hog farmers, and their interests are, are not the same. Same thing with the timber industry. They would purport to speak for uh, also the NCFA, the North Carolina Forestry Association. They would purport to speak for loggers when in fact their primary clients were warehouser and other big clients. So that was a real uh, problem, uh, in my opinion, in North Carolina. You know, the interests of Ardmore, Murray Fulcher, Jody Gay, Willie Phillips, and others, you know, were not being uh, reflected in the positions taken by the NCFA and the legislature. Uh, they were very, in my opinion, uh, rigid and inflexible uh, and, and again I felt like people with Governor Hunt were really trying to find uh, common ground and there was real resistance to do that because of a distrust or because frankly the seafood industry had squarely different interests than the people on the water and and, uh, and, and, and the latter interest never floated to the top to use a poor metaphor there yeah, that's really interesting. So it sounds like, um, you know, these fishermen were trying to be sort of band together and be represented um, through the fisheries, but it sounds like that almost sort of backfired in your opinion, if they were all saying the same thing, reading from the same script, it kind of just blurred all into one. Um, is there or was there a way that people could more effectively sort of represent themselves and tell their one story, but still be heard at that same level. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think there there's a lot of attempt to do that. There were small fishing associations, um, and you know when I would come back to Raleigh, I would I would try to represent to the governor and to the secretary that it's not homogenous out there. There are a bunch of different opinions. And then I would try to distill. The bottom line is these guys want to make a living. Uh, you know, they want regulations to be as uncumbersome as possible. Um, and there's got to be a way to do that. You know, there are proposals we should make that they're not going to like, but if we can just get them through, they're going to realize that uh, it's not the end of the world. You know, if there's a cap on commercial fishermen, uh, fishing license, there's a way to do it where you reward you know, people who are full-timers and maybe the people who aren't you know, have to pay a higher price. So, uh, but, but it was a real challenge to do that because any time a, a group of fishermen would try to speak out in a way that was different than their lobbying group, the NCFA, there was a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, not to do that, and, and a lot of pressure, I mean, serious pressure, where, you know, some people were told that, you know, the, the truck's not going to come pick up your catch next Thursday if you continue to speak out, and, uh, and that was also eye-opening to me, that, you know, it was actually a fairly intimidating uh, issue to work on, because when push came to shove, people could get their backs against the wall, and, uh, and 
it was not terribly you know pleasant to work in. I mean, you know, occasionally they would have uh, you know they criticized the fisheries director. I think they uh, you know burned uh, his you know didn't hang him in effigy, but basically you know burned him. <laughs> so if you were the fisheries director, you were really a, an unpopular figure, and uh, and the one that we brought in uh, ended up leaving, and yet another person came in. So that was a thankless job. But I think that's a real challenge. It's a challenge today, uh, this quota-based system called cat shares or individual transferable quotas. It works. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it works only because it works when commercial fishermen actually design it and make it work for them. And that's what happened in the Gulf of Mexico with the Red Snapper and Grouper. It happened in the Pacific. It's happened again in other parts of the world, but it works. But uh, in North Carolina, fishermen were not even allowed to sit down and really take a close look at how to make it work because the seafood industry didn't like the idea of empowering fishermen. If fishermen have more control over when they fish, they can fish when market prices are high. So again, the, the, the interest between the seafood industry, the dealers was distinct from from the uh, fishermen, so they never even got a chance to take a close look at this management system that would have been a real benefit economically to them, would, would have provided more security to them, would allow them to fish not when the season opened, but when weather conditions were good, when prices were good. So, uh, so that's been a, a problem, it continues to be a problem in North Carolina where people's voices are drowned out by you know, powerful lobbying organizations. And that, as far as I know, I haven't worked in North Carolina for a while, but I think that a, a, remains a, a major challenge. Yeah, that, <laughs> that does sound like a, a major issue. Um, I'm wondering if we can, I guess, backtrack for a minute. Okay. And um, do you think you could sort of describe the makeup of the um, steering committee and who was involved with it, a couple of names and positions and what they did. It's okay, it's not a pop quiz. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I can't remember precisely without going back to my files, but as I recall the steering committee, and you can correct me on this, uh, it's history, <laughs> there is a record. Um, but as I recall, the, the act of the legislature that established the steering committee allowed the Speaker of the House to appoint members, the President Pro Tem of the Senate to appoint members, and I believe the Governor. And I believe the legislation uh, designated slots, so a commercial fishing representative, a sports fishing representative, maybe an environmentalist. As I recall, conservation groups were not necessarily considered legitimate interest, which goes back to the allocation issue. Um, it was really sort of how to strike a balance between commercial and recreational. And so I remember that the uh, steering committee was chaired by uh, Bob Lucas, a, um, a litigator, a uh, lawyer from Selma, North Carolina, who I believe at the time was also the chair of the Marine Fisheries Commission, which is the state body that <coughs> enacts regulations governing fishing. So he was the chair. I can't remember who the vice chair was. He was intended to be a neutral uh, person, although again, uh, the commercial fishing sector in particular thought he was more sympathetic to the recreational side. He wasn't from the coast. He's a lawyer. Uh, in terms of the other members, um, you know, I can't remember. I think there was, uh, I want to say B.J. Copeland from Sea Grant from North Carolina State was on the steering committee. I can't remember if that's true. He was. He was, on, he was okay. And he was also on the commission. And there were, you know, people like Dirk Frankenberg, who was on the commission. I can't remember if he was on the committee. He was a professor, a uh, marine sciences professor at, at um, UNC. So you had some of those. Then you had fishermen, and you had, uh, again, recreational representatives. I just can't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. And then you had, um, you had the... Um, the Department of Environment, Health, Natural Resources. You had the political people like me who were there to listen and advise the secretary and the governor. And then you had the uh, career people with 
Division of Marine Fisheries, the scientists, the managers, etc. So they were all there. So you had a bunch of government people, you had a bunch of uh, committee members, and then you had stakeholders and members of the public. So, so you uh, mentioned that some of these folks were not from the coast. <laughs> and uh, while we do have fishing in other parts of North Carolina, um, you know, a lot of it is very coastal based. Did you notice any sort of like tension between or uh, between the coastal and non-coastal folks or any sort of hostilities there? Yeah, so the, you know, the moratorium was all focused on, uh, you know, marine fisheries. And so what that means in North Carolina, it means all the coastal waters, everything that is, you know, salt water or brackish. And brackish means it's a confluence of fresh and salt water. So really, from the coastal waters out three miles. So the state has jurisdiction to three miles. But you know, fish, coastal fishermen, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen go beyond three miles. Uh, and that's in federal waters. So you also had some federal interests at play. But the focus was on those fisheries that were predominantly within that three mile limit. The freshwater fisheries were governed by another agency altogether called the Wildlife Resources Commission. And that uh, was almost exclusively uh, recreational fishing. So in North Carolina, if you go fishing for trout or bass, that's under the jurisdiction of wildlife resources. Uh, there aren't commercial enterprises. So they were, not, they were not directly involved, although the people on the coast tended to uh, believe they should have a greater voice uh, in how resources in their backyard uh, or off the coast should be managed because they were the ones who lived and worked there. Uh, and in, in some way, and not everyone felt this way, by the way, but there was a tendency to say people from Raleigh, Raleigh, that's a four letter word, uh, you know, people from Raleigh. Um, but that they just, they weren't bad people, they just didn't understand. And, uh, and that, you know, they didn't have as uh, legitimate a stake in how things were done. Uh, and so there was a tension. Again, it seemed to be, um, yeah, very regional. Even, as I mentioned before, even along the coast, there are regional differences. Uh, where Harker's Island, which is near Beaufort, and other communities that were much more heritage-based tended to, the people there tended to be much more fierce in their opinions about the government or opinions about people who didn't live on the coast. Uh, I should say, I don't know if others have brought this out, but there was a fair amount of uh, sort of religious uh, uh, underpinnings to all this, and in, in, I think I mean that in two ways. One, sort of uh, heritage as a religion, fishing as a religion, but more importantly, uh, in North Carolina at least, there just tends to be uh, you know, faith is, tends to be very important to fishermen, and you have Christian faith predominantly, and, uh, and you would see that come up a lot in public hearings. People would talk about how, you know, God, they, it was a God-given right, but they were just very, their, their, their religious practices were very evident in their day-to-day -day lives, and it's something they talked about with great convic conviction. The leaders of the uh, NCFA at the time were were uh, especially religious. So that created an interesting uh, element to a public policy debate because it, it, it meant that it wasn't always uh, a matter of just trying to figure out rationally sort of what made sense, how to divvy things up, how to you know, use uh, sci the scientific method to establish a catch limit for fish stocks. There was this other element that was extremely powerful uh, in terms of influencing uh, people's opinions. So, so, yeah, that's interesting. Wow, no, I don't think anybody else has brought that up yet. Um, were there any other, you mentioned, you know, sort of regional differences. Um, were there any, uh, and you've mentioned heritage a couple times. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit more about how people um, drew back into their upbringing or their heritage, um, how they really brought that up and brought this to the fore? when having these public conversations? Yeah, I mean, often, you know, especially in the Outer Banks, um, I'm thinking Manio, Wanchis, uh, 
Hatteras, uh, Harker's Island. You tended to, ha to uh, interact with families uh, who had been fishing, commercial fishing for generations. And there are all kinds of names, the Daniels, the Tillets, the uh, Etheridges, uh, and several others, uh, the Smiths from, I think, Beaufort. And that, you know, they tended to, you know, wear their heritage, you know, as a badge. And I mean that respectfully, that it was, uh, you know, with great honor uh, and that their, their coming to these meetings, participating in this process was, uh, was honoring their, you know, their, their ancestors who had done this. Uh, it's what they had been doing since they were kids. They were children. It's what they knew. It's what they liked to do. And so it, it tended to come out a lot, and men and women were involved. Uh, fishermen's wives uh, were quite active, uh, not just in, in the moratorium steering committee debate, but were active uh, you know, in, in these issues uh, in general, before and after the steering committee. Often wives, generally wives, I mean, sometimes the spouses were husbands, but you know, mostly in North Carolina, it was a men's profession. The wives would often be proxies for their, their husbands who were out fishing. So they would be the ones who would come and testify with equal emotion and equal fervor. I remember uh, fishing uh, hearings in, in uh, Moorhead City where some of the fishermen's wives would show up and quite emotionally appeal to uh, the government to, to back off. Uh, so, 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 yeah, families, uh, forefathers, tradition, it was pretty much there all the time. And that was an advantage, I think, that the commercial fishermen had over the recreational fishermen. It was not a trump card, but it was something that, that I think was often used to establish more legitimacy in the debate. You know, we've been doing this forever. Uh, we've got a stake in this. You guys are you know, part-timers. We know what we're doing. We've been on the water. These rules that the government's proposing are crazy because I had one fisherman say they want to limit how many flounder we can catch, but there's so many flounder in the water, I'm afraid to take my dog there because they'll eat them. I mean, you heard stories like that all the time. Um, you know, there's so, so many striped bass. I don't know why there was a moratorium on striped bass fishing because uh, they're eating up all the crabs. And I'd have, you know, uh, fishermen in Wanchi show me photos of, uh, of the striped bass that they had cut open and there were a bunch of blue crabs. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I'm getting off point here, but uh, just the notion that, you know, we've been on the water uh, our entire lives, our parents and grandparents were on the water, you have to give us a greater voice than you're giving us. The government has to uh, respect us more than they do. And that was sort of the the, the tone. Yeah, and um, not to ask you to speak exactly for Governor Hunt, but do you feel like that was an approach that was fairly effective? Yes. Governor Hunt, uh, you know, was a great politician, but I think mostly he was truly committed to, you know, farmers, fishermen, people who worked the land. He would always say in his in his speeches to the environmental crowd or to, to you know, the country that his father was a soil and water conservationist. Uh, he, he was from a farming background. And he had, he had real empathy and sympathy to people who lived off the land and lived off the water. Uh, I was always impressed by how respectful he was. He was a great listener. He'd sit there and, it, and when you were talking to him, it was as if you were the only person in the room and he treated everyone like that. Um, and I think he was generally well respected. So when fishermen would take out, would express anger at the government, it was rarely against Governor Hunt personally. It was more either to the fisheries director or to the Marine Fisheries Commission or to the secretary or to, you know, to some you know, functionary like me. Um, but you know, Hunt had a lot of respect. And I think as, as uh, he continued to push us to get out there and really try to find uh, you know, policy positions that he could, he could ultimately sign, uh, you know, he, he really encouraged us to keep at it. And, 
and wanted to make sure at the end of the day that what he signed was was good for North Carolina and good for the uh, and good for commercial fishermen. He was also influenced uh, by Mark Basnight, uh, uh, arguably the most powerful Senate president, <coughs> pro tem, uh, you know, Senate leader uh, in certainly my memory in North Carolina, but he was from uh, Manio. He was fiercely protective of uh, commercial fishing interests, uh, but he also increasingly had pressure from the recreational side because Dare County is you know, dependent upon tourism and recreational fishing. But he was tough and he, you know, he would essentially call in Governor Hunt and as much as a legislator can call in the governor, but he would, you know, invite Governor Hunt to breakfast at uh, Finch's, this little meet and three place in Raleigh, uh, and basically give him the lot for if he felt like the, the executive branch was not, you know, spending enough time listening to commercial fishermen. When I would attend meetings with Senator Basnight, he would, you know, treat me as a representative of the secretary differently. He would treat me with, you know, he would be circumspect. Uh, he would challenge me on whether I was really there, you know, representing commercial fishermen. So, it, uh, so, so the great thing about Governor Hunt is I think that he respected Senator Basnight. Uh, both as a person as as a politician knew he needed to work with him, but ultimately it came back. He had great great uh, affection for for the fishermen, and I worked with Governor Hunt a lot on on the hog farming issue as well, which was equally as uh, controversial. And he showed the same respect for uh, you know for farmers. So you're talking about. Um you know, Governor Hunt and various stakeholders and how hard they were working to come up with something that respected the various stakeholders, um, the commercial and the recreational fishers. Uh, so in 1997, the Fisheries Reform Act was passed. Uh, what, I guess, what's your take on that? Do you think it was, a, I don't want to say good, do you think it was an effective law? Do you think it was the result of good policy? Uh, it, yes, I mean, I think it was an effective piece of legislation. You know, it's been so long I can't remember the ins and outs. What I remember leading up to it is that there, there were extensive negotiations between the governor's office and the secretary's office and the legislature, and predominantly the Senate. And so the Senate uh, had several staff members, lawyers, and legislative drafters that uh, were in the thick of it. And, uh, and they also were responding to constituents. So there was a lot of horse trading, a lot of back and forth. Uh, but again, they were under pressure to produce legislation that the governor would sign. And so as I recall, uh, it was a pretty decent uh, product at the end of the day. I think, you know, I think most, or mostly both sides felt like it wasn't too bad. <laughs> that all in all they came out pretty well. There was some unfinished business, uh, including uh, a proposed saltwater fishing license, uh, which was intended to uh, you know, require recreational fishermen to have a license so the state could begin to get a better handle on how much fish recreational fishermen were catching. And you might be surprised, but the recreational sector was for it and the commercial sector was against it. They were afraid that if it was a commercial uh, saltwater fishing license that it might further empower. It might sh demonstrate just how many recreational fishermen there are and it might somehow empower them. So that did not make the final cut. It was passed probably a decade later. Um, so all, all in all, I think it was good from a conservation viewpoint. We haven't talked about the groups like uh, the Environmental Defense Fund where I now work, but they were also involved in these hearings. And they were essentially making the case that uh, fisheries management is broken, uh, fish stocks are declining, uh, the conservation organizations respected that there needed to be a, you know, a fair allocation between commercial and recreational, that they did not take sides. Uh, but they were also principally interested in habitat. And again, I can't remember the specific provisions, but the 1997 law included 
protections for uh, fish habitat. Um, the 1996 Federal Fisheries Act, Sustainable Fisheries Act, which was a reauthorization, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, preceded the uh, state law and it included provisions on essential fish habitat. And essentially uh, what it did is it required that uh, the fishery managers identify those, you know, uh, you know, estuaries, those uh, seagrasses, those, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about mangroves and coral <laughs> reefs because that's where I work now. We don't have those here. But basically the near shore areas where fish, uh, you know, uh, where nursery areas occur, where fish spawn or where fish take refuge. Conservation groups were involved in the 1997 Act in order to make sure that if you got fishing right, uh, you also protected the habitats that that uh, you know that they depended upon, um, and that sort of was an interesting debate because the state was also figuring out what to do with runoff from from hog farms and other farming that was polluting waters. There were a bunch of fish kills back then uh, in the Neuse River, for example. And, uh, scientists at NC State were trying to figure out what was causing the fish kills. And so conservation groups were saying to the commercial fishermen, you know, you have to band together with us to, to get, you know, better pollution laws on the books, stuff like that. So uh, in the end, I think it was a good step forward. Uh, I think it, for the most part, it temporarily calmed uh, the water, so to speak. Uh, you know, it didn't end the debate. Uh, since then, there have still been continued problems with overfishing, although in many cases stocks have you know, bound, uh, rebounded. Uh, you know, last time I checked, commercial fishing was still on the decline. Uh, you weren't seeing a lot of young people come into commercial fishing. And there were proposals in the 2000s, uh, you know, after this act was passed, to go to an individual transferable quota system where again, commercial fishermen would be allocated a share of the resource and would have some greater stewardship incentive to take care of it. Uh, but it was, it was also essentially a, an investment uh, that a fisherman could pass on to future generations. It was a, essentially a business asset. And again, for various reasons, that's been controversial in North Carolina where it, it has not been controversial in the Gulf of Mexico, it succeeded. Uh, so I think, you know, fast forward 20 years, just about, um, commercial fishermen are still having trouble getting, you know, making a living. Uh, they're hanging on. Uh, you can still find, you know, some fresh and local seafood, but if you go to the stores in Chapel Hill, Carbor, Raleigh, for the most part, you're, uh, you're buying seafood from out of state. So I think, I think today more could be done to not only sustain the resource, but to help, uh, get commercial fishing sort of back. There's still debates over between recreational and commercial fishermen over whether uh, speckled, speckled trout, striped bass, and other species should be uh, the exclusive domain of recreational fishermen. So debates continue uh, somewhat uh, less intense. So, but all in all, I think it was, it was a good step forward. Well, uh, 20 or 19 now, almost 20 years out from the passage of the FRA, are there any things that um, you know today or that you've, uh, you've observed in the meantime that you wish you knew then? <laughs> Is there anything that's happened where you would have been like, if I knew that back in the mid-90s, we would have done this XYZ completely different? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, um, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I, yeah, on the one hand, I have more knowledge about what kind of fishery management's worked successfully, uh, again, in the Gulf of Mexico. And the program I keep talking about in the Gulf of Mexico did not come online until 2007. Um, so this concept of transferable quotas, at least in the U.S., was still untested. Uh, Canada and British Columbia had started doing it. Alaska halibut fishery was thinking about doing it uh, but it was a novel idea so uh, I, you know I'd like to say that with the knowledge I have uh, what I would do different uh, is to 
try to take North Carolina fishermen to other parts of the country and possibly the world. And, uh, and we did that actually in the 2000s uh, in my current position with EDF. We did take commercial fishermen to British Columbia to have them look at this quota system. Uh, it didn't work in that case, but uh, one thing I've learned is that if you can get fishermen together and kind of step back and just let them talk to each other, that uh, they generally respect each other and, uh, and they're more inclined to imitate what someone else is doing if, if they're doing it well than they are to listen to a government bureaucrat or someone who doesn't fish. So we've seen, I've seen since then that, you know, I work in Cuba now. And so uh, we're trying to figure, work with Cuban fishermen and the Cuban government on how to end overfishing. You know, 60% of fish populations in, in Cuba are overfished and it's getting worse. So we're trying to figure out how to come together uh, to do things differently. We've taken Cuban fishermen to Mexico We've taken them to Cape Cod, to San Francisco, to Morro Bay, which look at fishing cooperatives just south of San Francisco, to Belize. Um, and so I didn't know that back then, but had I known that, I would have spent more time trying to get uh, fishermen here to hook up with successful fishermen in other parts of the world. So they're called fishermen exchanges or learning exchanges, and it's becoming a tool that uh, is sort of catching on in general. So there's still potential to use it here. So uh, you've mentioned a number of different countries mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and fishing policies and approaches to it over you know the past 20 or so years. Um, where do you think that the FRA fits into sort of the grand scheme of things? You know, was this some really like um, mold breaking revolutionary new legislation? Do you think it was something that other um, other areas picked up on and learned from? Where, how does it fit in the, the whole narrative of fisheries management? I don't know. Um, my guess, you know, my guess is that it's not viewed, uh, it's not necessarily that well known outside of North Carolina. Other coastal states from Florida to Georgia South Carolina, and then New England, uh, where commercial fishing is uh, much bigger in places like Massachusetts, even in Maine. Um, I don't think they've really looked, they have a lot of the same issues uh, over allocation, over you know, how to establish science-based limits. They have a lot more issues in New England, for example, over big versus small. So you've got greater friction between the big industrial-sized fishing boats and the small um, scale fishing boats in small towns in Maine, for example. So the the issues tend to be similar, but a little bit different. So I, I'm not sure that uh, I'm the authority to, right? I can speak within the authority, but I, you know, I think that its impact was felt mostly. The law's impact was felt mostly in North Carolina. Um, I don't think it. Again, I think it was a decent piece of legislation. I think it had. Uh, it helped move things along here, but my hunch is that it wasn't. Uh, it, it, it wasn't. A, it didn't become a model for how to do things in commercial fishing. What do you think about um, the the FRA in terms of its ability to adapt over time? You know, it's been twenty years. Do you think it's it was or is sort of flexible enough to adjust to what's changed in fisheries and in North Carolina in the past twenty years? I think 20 years for one piece of legislation is a long time. I mean, typically uh, with environmental legislation, the, the goal is to reauthorize it, uh, to review and reauthorize it every five years or so. That rarely happens anymore in this contentious world in which we live in. But you know, laws, uh, I mean, circumstances change, demographics change, uh, economics change. Uh, you know, certainly the you know the coast has changed in North Carolina. It looks a lot different today than it did back then. More people live there. Uh, there are fewer commercial fishermen. Again, we import more of our seafood. So, so from the perspective of different stakeholders, is the law sufficient? And uh, again, I haven't worked on commercial fishing in North Carolina for several years now, but I would say no, because I would say that. Uh, 
the resources in better shape, uh, you know, catch limits and size limits, management measures seem to be working better than they did. You see fewer species that are overfished in North Carolina or throughout the U.S. So all that's good. I think from a perspective of commercial fishing, I think it, you know, it, it may uh, be a dying industry in North Carolina. I think there are many who believe that, you know, commercial fishing is no longer important to the state's economy, uh, that there are greater economic benefits from, again, recreational fishing. I don't share that perspective. Uh, I consider myself a fierce believer in commercial fishing because I think uh, it's good for, uh, I believe in sustaining the heritage, but more importantly, I think people want to eat fresh and local wild caught seafood. And, uh, and we have a bountiful coast. We've got waters that are capable of, of producing, you know, a lot of seafood for a lot of plates in North Carolina. And just as we're, we're putting a, placing a premium on farm to table, there's no reason we can't uh, place a premium on, you know, from fishing boat to table. Uh, and I'm afraid that unless things are managed differently, that commercial fishermen are fighting a losing battle. Uh, I think there's more potential for conservation groups and commercial fishermen to unite. Uh, recreational fish, fishing is still not as well managed. Uh, it's hard to count how many fish are caught recreationally, and therefore it's hard to, to manage it. Uh, whereas commercial fishermen have to report their landings. Uh, so I think, you know, if, if, if there was more solidarity between conservation groups and, and fishermen, you would see uh, management systems that not only protected the resource, but uh, resulted in more biomass in the water, resulted in better jobs on the coast, and resulted in more local seafood on the plates of North Carolinians. So I would uh, encourage uh, another look at the FRA and uh, with an eye toward clear, you gotta have clear goals. So there's no reason to touch it if, if, if there's not a crisis. And, and you know, again, I, you remember better than I do what crisis prompted the 1994 moratorium. But often, unless there's a crisis, people let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, you know, I think commercial fishing is slowly dying out. Uh, it's like what everyone says. It's like if you put a, a frog in cold water and then turn up the heat, he'll, he'll boil to death. If you put him in boiling water, he'll hop out. And I think that's what's happening in North Carolina. Slowly, people go out of business. Uh, young people won't replace them. Um, the seafood industry in places like Wanchi's will find it hard to compete. Many of those uh, companies have fishing boats that fish off the coast of South America. That's where they you know, earn a large percentage of their revenues. Uh, and I would hate to see commercial fishing, commercial fishing disappear. Uh, but I don't think it's, you know, it's Senator Baz Knight's retired, Governor Hunt's gone. Um, I don't see this as being the kind of priority it was back then. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know what Susan West is saying. <laughs> uh, there are many out there, uh, fishermen, wives, and others who are waving the flag uh, for uh, commercial fishermen, often coming from the heritage point of view. Um, I know Susan West quite well. She is not a fan of, of quota-based systems that allocate the resource to fishermen, or she wasn't last time I talked to her. Uh, but I think there's common ground where you, you, know, you, can, you can create a system where commercial fishing is gonna look different than it did you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but you're still gonna have it. And you're gonna have it on a small scale, so it's not gonna be controlled by big corporations like people are afraid of. It's going to be, you know, you're going to have people who live in Buxton and Hatteras and Shalot and Ocracoke uh, and Harker's Island and Beaufort, you know, fishing for a living. Uh, and again, unless things have changed, I don't, you know, I, th I think all we'll have is sort of a heritage fishery and, and nothing more. So that's my concern. But I'm working in Cuba now, so. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Talking again about the whole heritage approach to it, um, I think you mentioned 
much earlier in the interview that you worked with um, American Indian communities mm -hmm. who also had fisheries issues. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and maybe compare and contrast a little bit? Do you see any similarities? They're both groups who may have been relying on fishing for a long period of time and really have a connection to it. Yes, um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, for fishing communities in the Pacific Northwest, in Alaska, when they're still whaling, um, you know, it, it's truly a, a, a question of heritage, but it's also, particularly in the Northwest salmon fisheries, uh, you know, salmon fishing, for example, is vitally important to Indian tribes uh, in, Wa in Washington State. And so they have fishing rights that are either a result of Supreme Court cases or treaties or both. And um, in the case of, of salmon, you know, it's, it's, it's critically important for revenues. Uh, but their fishing practices are often harken back to uh, ways things were done. You I, I think you still see fishing wheels and various other practices that you know, have disappeared outside of Indian tribes. Um, but you also, in, you know, essentially you have a quota based system out there where Indian tribes are allocated uh, a percentage of the harvest in many cases. And again, I'm not up to speed on, on all this stuff anymore. But, uh, but then they are allowed to manage it um, in the same way a fishing cooperative might manage it with community interests in mind. So, so you get the social interest, you get the economic interest, and you get the conservation interest. And uh, really, all three have to go together. And uh, you know, the more that you have people fighting over social, economic, and conservation, the less likely you are to come to some resolution that truly works for everyone. But but uh, that is a good analogy. And you know, I think in North Carolina, they might take a page out of you know the way Indian tribes and others have done it. You know, there are fishing cooperatives in Mexico that have all come together, and they've been. Uh, essentially uh, allowed to co-manage the resource by the Mexican government. Uh, you know, they're on the water, they collect the science, they report the data, they have an interest in, uh, in monitoring the, the marine reserves, the protected areas, because they know those areas replenish fish populations and lobster populations. So you've got a situation there where, where the fishermen are actually enforcing and managing and monitoring and doing the science arm in arm with, with the government. Uh, and so that's you know a model that we haven't really figured out how to do here. Um, but in the case of Indian tribes, again, you know, like people in Hatteras and elsewhere, uh, you know, it's generations old. And the reason you know, they're still doing it is because that's what they want to do. That's what they know to do. And they're paying respect to their forefathers mothers. Yeah, you've mentioned, um, or we've talked a, a good deal about sort of, it seems like this is framed almost as having two sides. There's recreational versus commercial. Do you feel like those are just two poles that are never going to come together? Or do you think that there's a way that the two can coexist peacefully in North Carolina while maintaining healthy fisheries? I think they, they <clears throat> I think they can come together. We've seen in other parts of the world, and even in the Gulf of Mexico, where there's still uh, real divisions between the two sectors. You're beginning to see parts of the recreational fishing sector, head boats, charter boats, rally around this concept of a quota-based system. Uh, they see that it's worked uh, for them. They see that it's actually worked to keep commercial fishing within their limits. I mean, historically, commercial fishermen were going way over their quotas, just like used to happen in North Carolina. So by the time the, the season was closed, uh, commercial fishermen have caught, you know, caught way too, too many fish because uh, the data was catching up with what was happening on the water. So in the case of the Gulf of Mexico, you're seeing some parts of the recreational fishing community say, we like what the commercial fishing, fish, fishing sector is doing. They're actually responsible. They're finally responsible. So you're seeing that, uh, you know, that they can live together, that, you know, if commercial fishing is more sustainable, that means there's more fish in the water. I think the challenge uh, in places like North Carolina and 
the Gulf of Mexico is that the numbers of uh, recreational fishermen are increasing, arguably. Uh, I mean, anyone can go out and fish. You buy a fishing license now and you can go fish. And that, uh, yeah, there's a sense that, you know, the old formulas for allocating, you know, uh, fish, maybe in the case of red snapper in the Gulf, I think it's 60% of the total quota to commercial, 40%. To recreational, those numbers have probably changed. But you see the recreational sector saying, you know, we deserve more of the quota because there are more of us now. And so we have to spread out the catch among more people. So, uh, but I think the unifying um, goal is that, you know, more fish in the water benefit everyone. And, uh, and you know, recreational fishermen also like to eat fish, they're consumers. And, I think this sort of uh, local food movement, slow food, slow fish, you know, has helped commercial fishermen because, uh, you know, people prefer to eat, you know, fresh seafood. Right here in Carborough, um, there's a place called Tom Robinson's. Yeah, the uh, cinder block shack. <laughs> yeah, a little cinder block shack, and Tom died a few years ago, but uh, it's this wonderful place where uh, it's open from Thursday through Saturday. And on Wednesday, uh, they head out to the coast and they buy from various fishermen and seafood dealers. And so the cool thing about that, if you're a consumer in the middle, in the Piedmont of the state, is you begin to understand that, you know, bluefish isn't available all year long. Bluefish runs, at, you know, in, in the fall. Uh, 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 shad row, which is really delicious, you know, happens in the spring when the shad are running. Uh, soft shell crabs, you know, you start seeing them around March and, you know, you're still seeing them. But you understand that there's a season for seafood. You really don't get that if you go to Whole Foods or, um, or Harris Teeter or any of the grocery store chains. You, every, you know, tuna is always available, shrimp's always available, salmon's always available. And, uh, and there are very few places like Tom Robinson's where you can look at something and say, what's that? You know, that's a, a sheep, sheep's head. That's a, you know, a whelk, that's a conch, that's a stone crab. I didn't realize we had stone crabs in North Carolina. Well, we don't really, but, you know, so-and-so caught it. Uh, and, uh, and different kinds of tuna, you know. So tuna at Tom Robinson's isn't just tuna. It's either yellowfin or big eye or something else. And, you know, that's, that's a, you know, that's, you know, that's, I, I don't buy fish anywhere else. Um, unless I'm on the coast and then I'll buy it from a, a local, but you, you just don't see that much anymore. And, uh, and I have no idea what the original question was, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, I guess I have one more question more about sort of the policy and the retrospective. So again, it's been, um, 20 years out from the passage of the FRA over 20 years since the moratorium mm -hmm. steering committee was formed. Um, do you think, or what do you think that we did learn or could learn or could use today um, in politics in North Carolina um, that you observed during that whole process in the 90s? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think it comes back to your question about why a moratorium. But, you know, I think... Uh, I think we learned that if there's a way to kind of step back <clears throat> or try to step back and try to bring people together and try to listen to people, uh, you know, often you hear about government agencies holding listening sessions. And what that often means is that people are, in, are supposed to come and listen to the government agencies tell them about what rules they're proposing. Uh, what the moratorium steering committee did is they convened these gatherings where, where uh, people came and could be heard and could, could talk and could be listened to and um, that was a valuable lesson um, and it showed that what appeared to be irreconcilable differences were not that irreconcilable. Now people were reluctant to give up positions uh, in favor of interest, they were kind of wed positions but you know through this process people began focusing a bit more on what the interest was rather than the position. So we weren't successful in completely doing that. As I mentioned before, there was still work to do afterwards. Uh, 
there's still a level of acrimony uh, among the various sectors in North Carolina. But I think it was a very effective tool. And you know, since Governor Hunt, I haven't seen a governor in the, in, in the state of North Carolina who's had the patience, had the passion, and had the foresight to actually spend the time and the money. I mean, that was you know a long process. I mean, from the imposition of the moratorium to the law was three years. Uh, which was relatively long when you're faced with a moratorium on commercial fishing licenses. Um, so I think the biggest lesson is, uh, is maybe one of process, is, uh, is starting off by saying everyone has a legitimate you know, interest in this uh, policy debate. Everyone needs to be heard. You know, at the end of the day, however, you know, the government, the legislature and the executive branch have a duty to lead. Uh, I think that's often sacrificed, often if, if the government's in the middle of a resource dispute, I think they're often afraid to choose, they're afraid to lead, they're really desperate for consensus, and if they don't get it, they're paralyzed. I think some of that happened in North Carolina, but I think at the end of the day, Senator Baznight and Governor Hunt came together and basically agreed on, a, on, on legislation that would move things forward. And so my lessons are process, uh, getting everyone at the table, listening to everyone, taking time, and in the end, asserting some leadership and making decisions, uh, which you don't have to live with forever. Now, in the case of FRA, as you've pointed out, it's been almost 20 years. Uh, it's probably time to dust it off uh, and to open it back up and, and to revisit how we manage our resources. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And speaking of process, <laughs> mm -hmm. thank you for uh, being here for this interview. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Any thoughts about um, before, during, or after when you were in this position, or fisheries today, uh, sustaining the economies, the communities, anything? Uh, yeah, I th uh, probably. <laughs> You know, yeah, I think I, you know, my lesson, one more lesson is that it's really hard for people, myself included, to get rid of preconceived notions. Preconceived notions about other people, about other interest groups, uh, and, you know, it's really hard to listen. Uh, you know, we, you know, not just in fisheries, but in general, we tend to talk at each other instead of to each other. Uh, you see that playing out in this election year, um, you know. Having a political party is almost like having a sports team. And you almost see that in, in, in fisheries as well. You know, being a recreational fisherman mean, means you're a recreational fisherman and you're not, you don't really trust commercial fishermen and vice versa. You're a commercial fisherman, you're leery of the government, you're leery of recreational fishermen and conservation groups. And I, you know, I find that mentality really difficult to break. Uh, it has been broken. Again, I go back to the Gulf of Mexico where uh, conservation groups like mine uh, suggested that there be this quota-based system. That suggestion prompted in the mid-90s a moratorium on the use of these quota-based systems uh, because commercial fishermen didn't want to hear about it. And then there was about a six-year process during that moratorium, this long moratorium, where fishermen and conservation groups sat down together and at the end of the day the fishermen, the commercial fishermen, were the biggest proponents for this quota-based system because they took the time to study it, to go to British Columbia and other places where it's working, and they made it their own. And so I really wish that in a place like North Carolina, in the next phase, that, that uh, some of the fishing leaders like Susan West uh, and others who are still at it and still committed to doing it, I really hope that they can you know, come together with groups like Environmental Defense Fund and the CCA and other groups and really just say, okay, let's just, let's just start trusting each other for a change. Let's start listening to each other. Let's just put down, you know, our weapons. And, uh, and I think that's really needed, but uh, it's hard for people to get beyond that. And it's hard for people to trust each other. And, you know, um, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> That's all I have. That's it? So, yeah. All right.